Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Shuli Rubin Schwartz. I'm the chancellor of the Jewish Theological Seminary, and it is uh, a great honor to welcome all of you here um, for this uh, important convening on anti-Semitism and allyship. Um, as you know, this is a topic that uh, has really taken over these past months. I just uh, came here from a uh, closed door breakfast with New York City University presidents. And I would say more than half of the presidents said that they are spending 80 to 100% of their time on this issue. That this has overwhelmed and overtaken their campuses. Um, and this is a matter of utmost importance for us to think about and to examine. And that's what we're about to do today. I wanna thank my colleagues uh, who've taken an important role in the planning of this day and will be participating throughout this two-day conference. And I particularly wanna thank Tamara Newman, our Director of Convenings, for conceptualizing this and realizing this. And I want to thank my colleague, Rabbi Gordon Tucker, the Vice Chancellor for Religious Life and Engagement, who I would say first conceived of this idea and, um, and its framing, and uh, who is responsible in a larger sense for the uh, engagement of this institution, both with the intellectual ideas and the religious grounding mm -hmm. that um, is so essential to the flourishing of the Jewish Theological Seminary. Thank you all for being here. So I would like to add um, a word of a warm welcome. Um, I am Rabbi Gordon Tucker. Um, and I would like to um, just f frame what we're doing here with a, a little bit of institutional history. Uh, Judaism has uh, often been characterized throughout its history in various ways as being uh, countercultural. Um, and JTS has had its own um, countercultural history. You know, in the years that were leading up to and even during World War II, obviously the Jewish community had reason to be very deeply concerned with its welfare and its very survival, um, and thus to um, tend towards becoming insular. Uh, and yet this institution, exactly at that time, under its then chancellor, uh, Louis Finkelstein, uh, moved to create an institute uh, called the Institute for Religious and Social Studies as an institute that was uh, devoted to uh, interfaith dialogue and cooperation and visioning. Uh, founded in 1938, and we just let, wrap your head around that a little bit, about what, where the Jewish community was at in 1938 and the idea of taking at that moment this initiative to reach out and um, that institute continues to this day um, and is part of uh, the history of this institution's uh, reaching out in, uh, in the ways that uh, were envisioned then. Uh, just two years later, uh, a whole other initiative called the Conference on Science, Philosophy, and Religion was founded in 1940, and it went on for about three decades. Listen to some of the uh, topics that were uh, dealt with by some of the leading public intellectuals of that day, um, and there were publications that came out of this regularly. The role of democracy and the future of democracy in the world. Equality in society. What the post-war world order should be. Goals for American education. JTS then was a place where important conversations across disciplines were happening. 
And we have seen that continuously ever since through the scholarship of our storied faculty, through our library resources, the spawning of Jewish studies, uh, that graduates of this institution have, uh, have gone out to, uh, to create throughout this continent and throughout the world. This convening today um, is indeed part of a strategic plan, which means that it is something that is taking the conditions of the present and looking towards the future. And yet, you um, now at least have a taste of the fact that it is also very much a continuation of what we have done and what we have been. Because there are reasons for the Jewish community to feel a pull to insularity today. And our topic in these two days is very high on that list, as you will no doubt hear and, and have confirmed for you. And yet we believe that the phenomenon of anti-Semitism requires broader thinking across community and disciplinary lines in order to create better understanding and better commitment jointly to a better world. And uh, perhaps most countercultural of all is that last word in the title of this convening, the word allyship. Because we don't seek to deepen despair, though there are you know, really dark issues today, but we, uh, we want to start with a realistic understanding of where we are, but look for important signs of support uh, across the lines that divide us. You just heard about something that happened this morning that is really part of that. Um, just think about those issues from the 1940s and 50s, democracy, equality, the post-war world order, goals for American education, every single one of them is uh, as relevant and as pressing today as they were then. So uh, beyond today and tomorrow, you should expect more uh, from us and this institution. Uh, there are many things to say about, uh, about the state of Zionism today. There's many things to consider about the role of law in our society and the application of laws in our society, uh, and many more. Um, and uh, that, will be, uh, that will be coming in the, in the months and the years ahead because this really is part of a, a plan to build on, uh, on this uh, past that I have now framed for you. Um, my, uh, my colleague, uh, Tamara Newman, Dr. Tamara Newman, who is our director of convenings, um, is, gets the lion's share of the thanks for all of this. Um, and uh, she will thank some, uh, some other people uh, when, uh, when she comes up in just a moment. Uh, I just also want to note that we have a number of, uh, of students who are helping out with this, uh, with this session. Um, and uh, there, will, there are a couple of uh, handheld microphones in the back that they will be carrying around. When we get to some uh, question and answer period, they'll be able to pass the microphones um, uh, through to those who, uh, who have questions. And we thank them for, uh, for their service to us today. And without further ado, I want to introduce Dr. Tamara Newman. Thanks, Gordon. Um, well, just a few uh, brief words before we begin. Uh, Anti-Semitism is a perennial issue that seems poised to reemerge and then recede in di with different social conditions and, different, and in different historical periods. So uh, with this panel in particular and others to come, we hope to examine the conditions of emergence at present, but also, and equally important, uh, we hope to think about the possibilities for allyship, um, ways of standing together with other groups and communities uh, in the battle to, in the battle against discrimination, marginalization, and prejudice. We also hope today that we, we will engage in respectful dialogue and openness um, to learning from a variety of different angles and um, points of view that we haven't considered before. Um, and briefly, I'd like to give credit and thanks not only to Chancellor Shuli Schwartz and Vice Chancellor Rabbi Gordon Tucker, uh, 
who you've heard from, but also a couple of major themes. So firstly, institutional advancement and communications, Rabbi Joel Seltzer and Beth Merowitz, and community engagement, Rabbi Julia Andelman and Tom Cageden. And of course, uh, the, the powerhouse chief of staff, Ariel Halpern. Thanks a lot. And now uh, I'm going to uh, just begin by introducing our historical panel here. Um, so I, I'll give brief introductions in the order of presentation. Um, Dr. Benjamin Gampel first serves as the Dina and Eli Field Family Chair in Jewish History at JTS. He's a specialist in medieval and early modern Jewries, and his most recent book is Anti-Jewish Riots in the Crown of Aragon and the Royal Response 1391 to 1392. It won the 216 National Jewish Book Council's Nahum M. Sarna Memorial Award in Scholarship. Um, and this volume treats the riots and forced conversions of 1391 in the Iberian Peninsula and explores why monarchic authority failed to protect the Jews during these fate-filled months. Rebecca Cobrin is the Russell and Bettina Knapp Associate Professor of American Jewish History at Columbia University, where she's also the co-editor of Columbia's Institute for Israel and Jewish Studies. She's the author of many books, including Jewish Bialystok and its Diaspora, Indiana University Press, 210, and forthcoming A Credit to the Nation, East European Immigrant Bankers of Chosen Capital, The Jewish Encounter with American Capitalism, Rutger University Press, Sal Salo Baron, Using the Past to shape the future of Jewish purchasing power, the economics of Jewish history, UPenn Press, uh, and other publications that I've cut. Her writing regularly appears in the Washington Post, CNN, The Guardian, and Bloomberg News. Avinom Pot is the Morris Greenberg Professor of Holocaust Studies at NYU. He is the author of multiple books on Jewish responses to the Holocaust, and I've also shortened his CV. Most recently, Jewish Heroes of Warsaw, The Afterlife of Revolt, 2021. Co-editor of Laughter After, Humor and the Holocaust, 2020. Um, and uh, Understanding and Teaching the Holocaust, 2020. His newest book, Israel and the Holocaust was published by Bloomsbury Press as part of its Perspectives on the Holocaust series in February 2024. And finally, David Fishman. He's the professor of Jewish history at JTS. He's a specialist on Russian and East European Jewry, and he also directs Project Judaica, JTS's program in the Ukraine. David Fishman's uh, book, The Book Smugglers, won the National Jewish Book Award in the Holocaust category, and his co-edited volume with Alexander Ivanov, Jewish Documentary Sources in Lviv uh, Archives, a guide, is the recipient of the Association of Jewish Libraries 2024 Award for Best Judaica Reference Book. Professor Fishman is the editor of the online newsletter, The War in Ukraine, Jewish News. And, and with this illustrious panel, I'm going to hand it over to Benjamin Gampel, who will begin by with a talk called Alliances of Self-Interest, Jews and Their Protectors in the Christian Middle Ages. Thanks so much. Good morning, everyone. It's, it's nice to see all of you here and here at the seminary for what I hope and expect to be a two-day conference which will have us reflecting about anti-Semitism in particular and interesting ways. 
The topic that I've chosen my, for myself this morning is alliances of self-interest, Jews and their protectors in the Christian Middle Ages. Jews first in, encountered Christianity really in the waning years of the Roman Empire. But what my topic is going to focus on this morning is the High Middle Ages, starting with the 11th century in the Rhine River Valley amongst Jews whom we will characterize as Ashkenazim. It was a heady time for Jews, for Jews who found their way northward into Europe. Europe was just beginning to awaken from its slumber, from its feudal slumber, where most of the economy was based in agriculture and in the pasturing of animals. And some far-sighted leaders realized that they wanted to encourage economic development and a shortcut that they imagined would help jumpstart their economy was to bring in Jews. Wow. <laughs> Jews were seen as special. Jews were seen as possessed of a unique talent. The Bishop of Spire, yes, it's Bishop, in the year 1084, welcomes the Jews. He tells his Christian colleagues that the town of Spire will be augmented a thousandfold if Jews would be allowed to enter. And Jews come. Jews are protected. Jews are given rights to trade. Jews are allowed the opportunity to grow their own community. Yes, our conference the next couple of days is about anti-Semitism and allyship. Let me state at the open, the Jews have always sought allies. As a minority group, you always need to reach out to other folks to help you. And as much as also Jews have always sought allies as a minority group, they have always needed protectors. And who were their protectors when they first came into Northern Europe? Feudal lords, those who controlled the land, those who controlled society, those who were in charge of the most powerful armies. Jews had a tendency, and so understandably, of relying on central authority. It's not that Jews disdained their peers, disdained the horizontal alliance. It's that Jews understood that people who would protect them have to be the people with what it seemed then was unlimited power. Salem Barone, for many of us, our historiographical grandfather, the founder of Jewish studies at Columbia, spoke about these alliances as alliances of self-interest. The rulers invite the Jews because it's economically beneficial. The Jews come for the same reason, for their own self-interest, and they need protection. It works wonderfully when it works wonderfully. The Jews' invitation to come settle in Spire takes place in the year 1084. That seems like a factoid, but for some of you medievalists out there and even on the panel, you might also think about that in 1096, crusaders are going to assemble in the Rhine River Valley. 
prompted by a call to crusade by Pope Urban II in late 1095. Crusaders gather from all over of Christian Europe and they assemble in the Rhine River Valley in the same towns in which Jews have just begun to establish their communities. Ideologically, they're off to the Holy Land in order to recapture Jerusalem from the infidel, from the Muslims. And they realize that here amongst them are people who crucified God's only son for no apparent reason. Jews had allies. Their allies were the central authority, were the bishop. And their protectors attempted to protect them. Oh, it's an easy story if I would tell you that when things get tough, the folks who wanted to protect them really fell down on the job, but no, they tried. Rudiger of Speyer, who was the bishop who invited them in in 1084, his successor, Johann of Kreischgau, in 1096, attempts to protect the Jews. But when the city dwellers, amongst whom the Jews live, rose up against the Jews and made alliances with the crusaders, the bishop realized that his own life was in danger. He leaves, and Jews are killed in Speyer. Alliances of self-interest. Alliances generally, they're only as good as when everyone's self-interest coincides. Bleak? Cynical, or something we know ourselves. Maybe we know in our own personal family life. We're tripping from one disaster to another. I don't want you to imagine that Jewish life is one endless disaster. Jews thrive. But my point here today is that alliances can only be tested, are of importance, precisely at moments of crisis. At no moments of crisis, I love you, you love me, we're all in it together. So now let's take a trip of a few centuries to the late 14th century in the crown of Aragon. We'll move from our Ashkenazim to our Sepharadim. Jews on the eve of what will be probably the most disastrous events in medieval Jewish history could feel very comfortably that the crown of Aragon protects its Jews. The Jews are to be found at the royal court. And these are just not occasional Jews, but the wonderful, great, glorious, brilliant Jewish philosopher, Chastai Kreskes, is an intimate of the king and queen of the crown of Aragon. When riots erupt in the kingdom of Castile, neighboring Castile, let me, uh, my colleague, Professor Coburn, will have a wonderful slideshow. I, who am bereft of those technological advantages, want to call attention to the map that I, with Tamara's help, brought right up here. You see uh, Iberian Peninsula? <laughs> oh, good. Excellent. So you're focusing on Castile, aren't you? I know it's harder for some of you in the back, but if you would come forward. And then we have the crown of Aragon here on the Mediterranean. Riots begin in the crown of Castile. In June of 1391, they spread through Andalusia. They even go further north. 
We find riots breaking out also in Aragon, oh, two in the Mediterranean, uh, here in Valencia, then in Barcelona. Jews are being attacked, Jews are being forcibly converted. Chastai Kreskis is at the court. He has the king and queen's ear. He pleads for the Jews. And they also attempt to protect the Jews. And now we're going to learn something else. Your protectors are only as good as the ability of the protectors to protect. Oh, you can have alliances. But if Johann of Kreischgau simply cannot protect the Jews, or if Johann and Iolant in 1391 don't have the power even to help Chastai Crescus save his own son who was killed in Barcelona. Our friend Chastai Crescus writes a note in October of 1391 reflecting on his challenges. I'm going to quote, after forceful representations and the grand dispersal of all our possessions, nothing remained to us but our bodies. Crescus teamed up with his allies, with the king and queen. He raised funds for the Jews' protection. He did everything that could be done. But the rioters were too powerful. In this letter, something we Jews can also, and other minority groups can equally take lessons from, His conclusion is, royal alliances are still the only way for Jews to go. Relying on Jews in high positions are the only way that Jews could possibly be protected. Oh, it's sad. It's tragic. Being a minority is being vulnerable, is being harmed. I'm going to conclude with a banality. No allies are constant. Allies are only as dependable as the moment in which you need to rely on them. Thank you. So thank you for the invitation, perfect, um, to talk today about anti-Semitism, discrimination, allyship, but I've actually been waiting my whole career to be on a panel with Benji Gampel. So it's unfortunate for me that I have to follow him because I actually have real maps and I cannot be as funny. Um, but I am very honored to be here with my co-panelists and I actually want to thank that I actually started this research after October 7th. Um, and it is, this is a work in progress, and I could not have done it without Michelle Margolis, the unbelievable Alexander Librarian at Columbia. And you know what, I will just get started. I want to just note up front, because I was literally at a conference yesterday on anti-Semitism, that October 7th is a point of inflection in Jewish history. Okay, we are gonna have to think differently about such topics as Jewish sovereignty, Jewish power, and as an American Jewish historian, this question about Jewish integration and the state, and how the narrative of American Jewish exceptionalism, the notion that America has been different and exceptional for Jews has really, I would argue, been exploded Right? And the notion that the general consensus, I would say, among American Jewish historians was before this, except for the Leo Frank case and little, a few little exceptions, that Jews may have confronted anti-Semitic uh, prejudice in the United States, even malevolent behavior or open hostility, but they never faced deadly violence like their beleaguered co-religionists in Europe. 
I think since October 7th, we have uh, many scholars, that's why there has been, uh, I have five conferences in the next two weeks, have been thinking about, and I'm gonna quote my colleague Eric Foner, the history we have been taught could not have produced the present in which we are living. So, I want to say for the American context, the way I define anti-Semitism at its core is the treatment of Jews as unequal or inferior members of our community, somehow less deserving of the rights we claim that are afforded to everyone else. Indeed, from the establishment of the United States, Jews, as opposed to other countries, were emancipated, but this is key for how I understand anti-Semitism. And as we heard, this concept of allyship I had not heard before today, but the notion of alliances comes from Salo Barone, who I live in the house built by Salo Barone, literally, figuratively, my chair is endowed by his cousin. Okay, so I think it's important to understand how he understood there are vertical alliances, which we just heard about, Jews allied with uh, either the royalty or ruling powers, the state. But in the United States, Barone argued that America with its vast empire of non-authoritative uh, state bodies and pluralism demanded horizontal alliances for protection. That's what Jews were needed, and Jews had to form reciprocal ties with other social groups and not depend on vertical alliances with a strong state like they had in other periods of Jewish history. So today what I'm gonna be doing is I'm gonna look at Columbia University, my employer, over 100 years ago from the archives as a prism through which to think about the specific dynamics shaping anti-Semitism in the United States and the complex challenges of Jews and this concept of allyship. So, indeed, from the founding of Columbia, like all of uh, the Ivy League, Jewish texts were central to the curriculum. But actually dealing with the diversity of actual Jews on campus became a major issue at the turn of the 20th century. Jews continued to make allies with other groups, and I'm gonna focus on two people, both from the top, Jacob Schiff, through his philanthropy, used his vast wealth to try to change the university and failed, as I will discuss, but also from the bottom up. Morris Hilquit, uh, founder of the Socialist uh, Party of America, engaged the student body throughout, I'm talking about the first two decades of the 20th century. The failure of both of these men to make alliances and help Jews become fully integrated into Columbia and treated as equals can be summed up in the events, and I'm gonna focus a lot on 1917, and the tragic fate of Leon Sam Sampson, a person who I will talk a lot about, and you can see he's all through the newspapers, but I cannot find one picture of him, which speaks um, to where he is. So to set the stage, uh, in November uh, 1913, and I just want everyone to understand, right, Morningside Heights was just the new campus, Seth Lowe, mayor of New York, wants to build the campus, right? And he engages many people in New York City using his contacts as mayor and also as president of Columbia University. In November 1913, William Barclay Parsons, head of Columbia University's Board of Trustees, pens a note to another trustee as part of the board's longer discussion of its, quote, Hebrew problem. Indeed, too many qualified Jewish students were applying to study at Columbia, and there was mounting pressure to appoint a generous Jewish donor to the university's board of trustees. These could not be ignored. But this is what he wrote, to his quote. In character, Jews are terribly persistent. They realize that there has been 2,000 years of prejudice against them, and they are seeking special privileges for themselves and their people. They have retained their special calendar, their holidays, different that from everyone else. They indeed represent the worst type of immigrants. They supply leaders to anarchists, socialists, and other movements of unrest. The fact that they have not been admitted to our board is recognized generally by the people of the city of New York, and there is no doubt that our board is regarded as the highest honor that a man can receive in that line." End quote. This letter typifies, and I should say is the tip of the iceberg, of other discussions in Columbia University's Board of Trustees to the perceived challenges 
of the growing presence of Jews in New York City. Indeed, the historical fact that New York City is the densest concentration of Jews in the world in 1920 is not lost on them. Between 1880 and 1940, the population of Jewish immigrants grows from 80,000 to 2 million. Jews comprise 30% of New York City's population, but 35% of high school graduates are immigrant Jewish young men. And it's important to understand Columbia does not have dormitories until 1960s, into the late 1960s. So it has to draw on uh, students from New York who commute from their homes, including my dad. He commuted from home and went to Columbia. By 1917, Jewish students topped 25%. Columbia trustees saw this as disproportionate, but as I just noted to you, it is reflective of the demographics reshaping New York City itself. Okay, I'm gonna just sip. So Jacob Schiff, um, I don't think I need to give a biography of Jacob Schiff in this room, okay? Uh, banker, philanthropist. I would argue Jacob Schiff is trying to make alliances with the board in a way of traditional Stadlanut, meaning inter wealthy Jews in Europe saw themselves as intercessors and used their wealth to influence the position of Jews in the societies. So what Schiff is, being, is doing throughout the first two decades of the 20th century is using his philanthropy to Columbia to make arguments for how Columbia has to restructure itself. His main pressure is that a Jew should be appointed to the board of trustees. Indeed, um, he, this is his uh, gift of uh, $100,000 to endow a position in the School of Social Work, actually the first position, which I should say is $6 million today. We should just talk about the vast sums. But he is extremely unhappy, okay? And I, I wanna read this letter out. <clears throat> I took expert. <clears throat> <clears throat> excerpts for because I think it's important to read what he writes. This is in 1907, and it speaks to the failure of allyship. So this is when he uh, writes to the president of Columbia, which is Nicholas Butler, quote, I am, however, frank to say personally, I have decided not to further contribute towards the needs of Columbia until the large portion of the population of our city of the Jewish faith be accorded representation in the board of trustees. I have taken up the discussion of this subject 15 years ago with then president Seth Lowe and have had taken occasion to discuss it with you. Soon after you were called to the presidency of Columbia University, I have earnestly urged both upon President Lowe and you, that a class comprising of 25% of the population, and I'm sorry, I skipped. So he's talking both that the student body should have a number more Jewish students and be, um, have a member of the board. The last, I'm gonna just read the last paragraph. Aside from the considerations of direct value to the university, I feel so long as representatives of the citizens of the Jewish faith are, by a tacit understanding, kept out of the government of Columbia University, and then he goes on to other, prejudice is being kept alive against the Jewish population. With those that lead uh, public opinion should do everything in their power to eliminate. Indeed, he is direct and states very openly how he sees Columbia as a symbol in New York City and wants it to change. Indeed, he fails to get the first Jewish, uh, sorry, there are Jewish trustees for Columbia up until 1816, and then there isn't another one until 1928, uh, Benjamin Cardozo. So he fails in this effort, and he turns instead to give his money to Barnard. And indeed, to this day, the central uh, hall of Barnard is named after Schiff. The 500,000 is $30 million in today's Dollars, okay, so he gives a vast sum to Barnard where he feels he can have more influence. But what I want to just now talk to, all right, that is a, a case of, I would say, failed allyship, all right? He tries to talk, use his funds, he sees himself as a certain class, and his voice is not heeded. I could not stop thinking of Leon Sampson over the past six months as uh, Columbia's campus was rolled with uh, protests and concerns over free speech. Students and faculty have both seen themselves enmeshed in an unprecedented uh, struggle over a war taking place in the Middle East, but also with the administration over free speech. And indeed, one of my colleagues proclaimed that, that no one protests like this had never taken place before. 
I suggest they all go look at the archives because indeed it did. The summer of 1917, this is as uh, May 1917, the United States enters the war in April 1917. In May 1917, the United States passes the Selective Service Act of 1917, which creates a draft, and the campus erupts in protest. Indeed, two students are arrested. Um, Charles Phillips and Owen Cattell, Cattell who, uh, and Owen Cattell, his father is actually on the faculty of Columbia, are arrested for circulating a petition against the draft. Passivism is alive and well on Columbia's campus. And indeed, what happens is after they're arrested, um, they're brought, they're indicted, and the person who actually defends them is Morris Hilquit. So this is what I'm trying to say. This is an attempt at an allyship. Morris Hilquit, the uh, Russian Jewish immigrant, founder of the Socialist Party of America. Um, he runs for Congress. He runs for mayor. He is extremely politically involved. He takes on these two students. And I should just say they are not Jewish, right? And he fights for them. And actually, they are not indicted in the end. And they are actually given a much smaller fine than was expected. But what has to be also known is at the same time that this is taking place, um, a young man by the name of Liam Sampson who emigrated from Russia to New York City in 1908 um, and is a student at Columbia. On June 11th, he uh, is an avowed, so I should just give, he's an avowed pacifist and he is the head of Columbia and City College's Intercollegiate Peace Society. Indeed, he is anti-militaristic, anti-war. Um, on June 11th, he gives an address to an Emma Goldman meeting held at the Royal Lyceum, which was a big meeting place. And at the meeting, as the New York Times reports, he proclaims the following, quote, we have no love for the Kaiser, but just as much as we hate the German Kaiser, we even hate more the American Kaiser. We should refuse to stand up and shoot down our brothers, and then he calls the war a dollar war. And in the end, he argues, the draft riots of the Civil War will not compare to the draft revolution that will occur if truly uh, America embraces a draft. After saying that on June 11th, on June 14th, he found himself expelled from Columbia University by the trustees. Soon thereafter, uh, two professors, Professor Dana of the English Department and Professor James Cattell, his son Owen, was arrested. Both found themselves um, with early resignation from Columbia and uh, or enforced into retirement. And Charles Beard, who is probably the most famous historian of the early 20th century, was also forced to leave Columbia and ultimately founds a new school for social research later on. So it is a time of great turmoil and I would say worse than anything we've been experiencing now, but it's important just to remember what happened. Samson, after his expulsion, brings a lawsuit against Columbia because he argues that he spoke at the rally in June after he was no longer a student. He had completed his coursework, and it was over the summer. Could Columbia punish him for what he said off campus when the semester was already over? Indeed, as the Columbia Spectator reported, sorry, I'm just going to go. Um, sorry, I just want to give uh, a little background about Morris Hilquit and how he's engaging the, uh, the students. Two minutes, OK, I'm very close to the end. OK, Hilquit is not only running for mayor, but he is constantly recruiting students to help him in his, in his uh, vying for mayor, you should just understand, New York City is very, very worried that there's going to be a socialist mayor, and he gets as many votes as the incumbent mayor, all right? He is not a no one. Everyone knows who he is. But what is really important, this is, he predates that he was running for Congress. I'm sorry that I have to rush through this. What's important to understand is I'm getting back to um, uh, Samson's friends. That's what we're on. We're on Leon Samson, all right? Leon Sampson sues. The court ultimately finds in favor of Columbia. It argues that uh, Sampson is morally unfit. He deserved expulsion because he sought to impair the influence for good upon its students that Columbia seeks to do. Indeed, his kind, quote, this is from the um, court decision, are worthy of punishment. And the university 
is not only supposed to import, uh, impart knowledge, it also has to make its students into good, loyal patriots. Indeed, as a result of this turmoil, and I should just say Samson's friends organize protests, they organize protests about the professors who are forced to resign. As a result of this turmoil and the court order in the next decade, Columbia totally revamps its admissions process, requiring interviews, new admission forms, it sets a quota, it revamps its curriculum, the core curriculum is born in 1919, and it sets up new venues for education. Seth Lowe Junior College is the topic of a whole nother talk, but you can listen to Mark Oppenheimer's podcast, it, it, it tells all about it. We can learn a lot from Columbia's attempt to keep growing ranks of qualified Jewish applicants from stepping foot on Morningside campus. It's part of a larger epic story in which discrimination against Jews defined and reconfigured the world of higher education after the First World War. To be sure, Columbia is far from the only institution to discriminate against Jews in admission, but the ways in which Columbia transformed its process of admissions actually reshaped higher education. And we accept many of the things that they put in place has become the norm throughout higher education. Other religious and racial minority groups also suffered in higher education and in the Ivy League. But I seek to highlight how Columbia, with its presence in New York City, where it's the largest Jewish concentration of Jews ever in the world in an urban area, we cannot ignore how it historically dealt with students from not from its targeted clientele, who they believed held distinctive political beliefs, not in line with what they were trying to teach. The strategies they developed to keep these qualified Jewish students, and I should just say, before 1920, all you needed to do was take a test to get into Columbia. It has totally changed after 1920. So just two words of conclusion. By looking at the efforts of men like Jacob Schiff through his funds or Morris Hilquit through his activism to form bombs with other groups at Columbia, either the trustees or the students, we see the limits of horizontal allyship in the early 20th century. But I wanna end with Leon Sampson's words because as I said, I cannot find a picture of him. He said to the spectator, quote, after his expulsion, his removal was, and this is all, absolutely unjustified and ruined my whole career. I have been refused admission to two universities, he had already applied to law school, because Columbia authorities will not give me a record of honorable dismissal, and officials in Albany have refused to give me a, their certificate so I can study law. I was not given a fair he hearing by Columbia authorities, and anyone who believes in fair play and does not support me in my fight is a moral coward, end quote. Indeed, as he has his opinions as well, I think we just want to understand that the strategies developed by Columbia College to address the turmoil of 1917 have much to say about bigotry, discrimination, and racism in the United States. Racism takes on many forms. It is based on a series of stereotypes, but it is also ideological a way of looking at the world that justifies and explains material structures of inequality and determines the life chances of racialized groups. The expulsion of Leon Sampson reminds us how Jews have been fundamentally challenging the vision of the nation and how they are seen in this moment against the moral fiber both by the court order and Columbia's board of trustees. By thinking about anti-Semitism and allyship in America through this small case study, we see how different historical dynamics have produced biased views of various groups. Jews have long fallen out of discussions of discrimination in the United States, but Jews, are, and Jews are far from the only group discriminated against. But we cannot forget how Jews were discriminated against if we hope to understand the broader world of higher education that still debates the role of testing, quotas, and interviews in college admissions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rebecca. I'm going to just try to.
Okay. While that is uh, being loaded, I will <clears throat> say my thank you. So thank you to uh, JTS for organizing this uh, very important and timely conference. And thank you for inviting me to uh, join this very distinguished panel uh, to situate this moment uh, within the broader context of Jewish history and think more broadly about how we can learn from the past in order to try to better understand the present in which we are living. So uh, I took a slightly different uh, sort of uh, approach to thinking about allies and allyship, as you can tell from my, uh, from my title slide. And this is to focus on a brief moment in time in the aftermath of the Holocaust, in the aftermath of World War II, when the allies, in this sense, played a significant role in helping to uh, reshape uh, uh, the history of the Jewish people in the aftermath of the war. So the Jewish displaced persons, or Sherita Pleita, the surviving remnant, emerged from the catastrophe of the Holocaust to form a vibrant, active, and fiercely independent community that played a prominent role in diplomatic negotiations, ultimately leading to the creation of the State of Israel. For a brief period following the war, however, a significant remnant of Europe's surviving Jewish community came to live in an entirely transitional situation in the displaced persons camps of Germany, Austria, and Italy, where they came to terms with being forced into exile from their pre-war homes and with the destruction of European Jewish life and communities. Survivors engaged in complex processes of rebuilding their shattered lives, involving prolonged periods of migration and life and transit. And so as we consider our theme of anti-Semitism and allyship here today, I want us to reflect on a period of time when a population of survivors felt largely abandoned and alone, resolving to help themselves out of their post-war predicament. While survivors succeeded in creating and recreating elements of pre-war Jewish life that had been destroyed during the war, the DP period was a transitional moment as the vast majority of survivors longed for a solution to their stateless condition and hoped for resettlement in new homes and new communities around the world. In this brief post-war period, survivors set the agenda for forms of Holocaust commemoration, religious responses to catastrophe, survivor politics, reconstruction of families, publishing, and documentation that would define the ways in which survivors carried their wartime experiences to new communities around the world. At the same time, Jews and non-Jews from the outside world played a key role in assisting the surviving population in resolving its stateless condition. And this picture that you're looking at, which if I don't have time to explain later, is young survivors on an agricultural training farm called Kibbutz Nili, uh, from the acronym Netzach Yisrael Shaker, established on the estate of Julius Streicher, uh, one of the foremost anti-Semites and publisher of Der Sturmer. Beginning in the summer and fall of 1944, as Allied troops moved across Europe in a series of offensives against Nazi Germany, and here I'll skip ahead uh, to, to a, an image, um, different map of Ashkenaz, uh, Benji. Um, <laughs> as Allied troops moved across Europe in a series of offensives against Nazi Germany, they began to encounter tens of thousands of concentration camp prisoners. Soviet forces were the first to approach a major Nazi, Nazi camp, reaching Majdanek near Lublin in July of 1944. American forces liberated the Buchenwald concentration camp near Weimar on April 11, 1945, a few days after the Nazis began evacuating the camp. British forces liberated concentration camps in northern Germany, including Neuengamme and Bergen-Belsen, entering the Bergen-Belsen concentration camp in April of 1945, and here you can see an image of the publication published by the surviving population in Bergen-Belsen called Unser Stimme, Our Voice, marking April 15th, uh, 1945 to 46. In Bergen-Belsen, some 60,000 prisoners, most in critical condition because of a typhus epidemic, were found alive, although more than 10,000 died from the effects of malnutrition and disease within a few weeks of liberation. When Allied forces liberated the camps in the German Reich, they encountered approximately 8 million people, 
obviously mostly non-Jewish, whom they categorized as displaced persons. That is, foreign nationals who needed allied assistance and care before they could be repatriated to their countries of origin. These were forced involuntary laborers, concentration camp inmates, prisoners of war, among them some 90,000 Jews who were survivors of Nazi labor and death camps and death marches. And so immediately following liberation, the country was inundated, Germany, with millions of these DPs or displaced persons. And you can see here the definition that the allies came up with for what a displaced person was. DPs as a whole were initially divided into categories by place of origin into those from enemy and allied countries. Germany and Austria were divided into American, British, and Soviet zones of occupation. And here you can see here a map with the zones of occupation with a small area in the southwest of Germany made into a French zone of occupation. So the majority of the Jewish population, and this is critically important, perhaps 35,000 to 50,000 of those liberated was in the American zone of occupation in Germany, many of them in camps uh, that would be found around Munich. By September of 1945, the Allies had repatriated some six million displaced persons. And while most of the millions of non-Jewish displaced persons made a comparatively easy decision to return home, the Jewish DPs did not face such a clear decision. And so soon after liberation, Jewish survivors began to search for surviving family members, although most Jews found few that had survived. Those survivors who remained in the DP camps found deplorable conditions, poor accommodations, no plumbing, no clothing, rampant disease, continuing malnourishment, and generally the lack of any plan to what to do, for what to do with the surviving population on the part of the American military. So Jewish chaplains serving with the American military were among the first Jews to encounter survivors in the camps, along with occasionally Jewish brigade soldiers, a division from Palestine serving with the British Army. While the JDC, the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee, sought to gain access to the camps as early as May of 1945, they were denied access until August, some three months later. So this meant that in the earliest stages after liberation, survivors depended on the US Army and the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration for relief, and on this small group of Jewish chaplains who played an especially significant role in tending to the needs of survivors. One particularly active chaplain, Rabbi Abraham Klausner, who aided in the early political organization of the surviving remnant, created a tracing service for survivors to find one another, which he called the Sheri Tapleta. And you can see here the title page of this publication. But as he summarized in a June 1945 report to Philip Bernstein, liberated but not free, that is the paradox of the Jew. There seems to be no policy, no responsibility, no plan for these stateless Jews. 12 hours a day, I tell my lies, Klausner wrote. They will come, I say. When will they come, they ask me. UNRWA, JDC, Red Cross, can it be that they are not aware of the problem? It is impossible. Of what use is all my complaining? I cannot stop their tears. America was her hope, and all America has given them is new camp with guards in khaki. Freedom, hell no. They are behind walls without hope. So organizing amongst themselves, Jewish DPs voiced their frustration in letters to military authorities and world Jewish organizations pleading for assistance from the US military government and UNRWA to rectify their miserable situation. Expecting to be welcomed by the world with open arms, uh, the Jewish DPs continue to struggle to obtain bearable living conditions. While the JDC, denied, with the JDC denied access to the military zone of occupation, survivors worked together with the GIs and the chaplains to organize help for themselves. Klausner, as you can see here, met Zalman Grinberg, a doctor and a survivor from Kovna, who had became a close colleague in rebuilding Jewish life in the aftermath of the war in Bavaria. Grinberg wrote to the World Jewish Congress of May of 1945, expressing disappointment with the slow arrival of relief. It has been four weeks since our liberation, and no representative of the outside Jewish world has come to be with us at the worst tragedy of our time. He went on, we must ourselves, with our own diminished strength, help ourselves. 
And so we can see this process that begins to unfold in the aftermath of the war in which survivors working closely together with uh, Jewish soldiers in particular from the US military begin to organize themselves. Klausner himself organizes a letter writing campaign to raise awareness of the plight facing the survivors in the immediate aftermath of the war. And Klausner, and I've written about him separately, is significant in helping the surviving population get organized and create a central committee and become uh, able to represent their own needs before the Allies. The reports of, two minutes, the reports of continuing deprivation and poor organization of recovery sent by DPs and Jewish chaplains eventually prompt American officials to take a greater interest in the problem of the displaced persons. President Truman dispatches Earl Harrison, who at the time was the dean of the University of Pennsylvania Law School, to survey conditions in the DP camps. In his scathing report back to Truman, Harrison concludes that, quote, we are treating the Jews as the Nazis treated them, except we do not exterminate them. He proposed that Jews be separated into their own camps. Until then, they had been forced to live with other national groups and former collaborators. And in order to resolve their refugee status, he proposed that 100,000 immigration certificates to Palestine be granted immediately to the Jewish DPs. Following Harrison's report, American authorities under the leadership of Eisenhower worked to improve conditions for the DPs, moving them to separate Jewish DP camps and agreeing to the appointment of an advisor for Jewish affairs. And it's in this period of time that uh, we can see a large population of Jewish survivors coming from Eastern Europe as part of the Bricha, creating a population that uh, by 1947 numbers 250,000 survivors, Jewish survivors, living in the uh, zones of occupation in Central Europe. And it's in this period of time where the Joint becomes more involved in helping to provide relief and assistance, UNRWA becomes more involved, the US military gets more organized, and the Jewish agency plays a critical role in sending emissaries to uh, work together with the surviving population in the DP camps. Uh, it's also in this period of time that we see the surviving population uh, beginning to get organized in these Jewish displaced persons camps. Uh, boasting uh, a vibrant social and cultural life with a flourishing press, theater life, active Zionist youth movements, athletic clubs, historical commissions, and yeshivas testifying to the rebirth of Orthodox Judaism. The surviving population in this period of time takes an active role in representing their own political interests, political parties, mostly Zionist in nature, with the exception of uh, a few members of the Jewish Labor Bund and the Aguda Agudas Yisrael fighting over camp committees uh, to represent the surviving population. There's a flourishing DP press, a literary culture, which assists in creating uh, this uh, reckoning in this post-war period. Historical commissions are created, theatrical groups are organized, and we see uh, all sorts of a flourishing period of Jewish culture in the immediate aftermath of the war in these displaced persons camps for a very, very short period of time. The survivors realized that they live in a unique moment of time where they had a short window of opportunity to document what had happened to them and also to process uh, what had happened. And if I had more time, I could tell you what's going on in this picture, but you can imagine first Purim after liberation. Um, and uh, we can see in this uh, period of time, the young uh, survivors, uh, as they're waiting for departure from the DP camps, in numerous ways, the demonstrations of a Jewish presence in post-war Germany, and we can see this in, with baby characters uh, testifying to the baby boom in the DP camps, a focus on education of Jewish youth, uh, the, the, um, the press, the youth movements, the farms, et cetera. These are all poignant affirmations on the part of the surviving population that we are here, mir sein und do. A defiant declaration that even in the aftermath and after the destruction of the Holocaust, the Jewish people and the eternal Jewish spirit could not be eliminated. And I just wanna wrap up with a thought for us to consider as we think about sort of this post-war resolution of the uh, Jewish statelessness, the notion of abandonment and isolation in the aftermath of the war. The Harrison Report serves to link the resolution of the Jewish DP situation with the situation in Palestine, thereby elevating the diplomatic impl implications of the Jewish DP political stance. International observers from the Anglo-American Committee of Inquiry in the United Nations 
deem DP Zionism central to the resolution of the political conflict over the land of Palestine. And as for survivors themselves, as their stay drags on in Europe, they stage these mass demonstrations condemning the British blockade of Palestine and participating in Ali Abed, uh, underground immigration to Palestine, most notably in the Exodus Affair of 1947. Um, and I just want to end with uh, a thought about the UN and the United Nations Partition Plan of November of 1947, where they recommend that the problem of the 250,000 Jewish displaced persons be dealt with through the partition of Palestine. This announcement was greeted with great enthusiasm in the DP camps, and the Central Committee of Jewish Survivors declares that on the ruins of the diaspora will arise the Jewish state, which will represent the most beautiful ideals of our people, and will give the possibility to return the Jewish masses of the historical past and the coming future. With the help of the Jewish state, the Jewish camps in Germany will be liquidated, and the Jewish people will return to the family of free nations after 2,000 years. And so we can think about sort of the role that in this case the allies take in trying to resolve the problem of Jewish statelessness and answering this question of where do we put the Jews? And I'll stop myself there. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's a privilege to be on this panel and in this <clears throat> conference. Um, I am last because we chose chronological order. That means I'll be speaking about a period that some of us remember in our lives. Uh, I don't have PowerPoint and I don't have the oratorical skill of Professor Gampel, but I hope you'll find the topic of interest. Um, I'm going to be talking about state anti-Semitism in the Soviet Union during a 27-year period of time, from 1953 to 1980. That is, from the death of Joseph Stalin until the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. Now, this isn't a marginal topic in post-war Jewish history because, <clears throat> according to the Soviet census in 1959, there were more than two million Jews in the Soviet Union, and that was by far the largest Jewish population in Europe after World War II. And I'm going to base my remarks on a large historiography. I can't give credit to all the scholars who have worked in this field. The years of late Stalinism, 1948 to 1953, often referred to as the black years of Soviet Jewry, were the peak years of Soviet anti-Semitism. When Yiddish culture was liquidated, its leading figures were executed, Jews were depicted as enemies of the state, Jewish doctors were publicly vilified as murderers in white robes. But I'm going to focus not on late Stalinism, but in the post-Stalin period, because that is when anti-Semitism became institutionalized, routinized, and embedded in Soviet life. Even when there were, was liberalization in other spheres, the treatment of Jews always lagged behind. And needless to say, anti-Semitism as a state policy is a much graver problem than anti-Semitism as a social or political phenomenon. Uh, when I'm speaking about Soviet state anti-Semitism, I'm going to give five areas of policy where this was evident. One is employment. Jews were excluded from certain sectors of the economy. They were not in the foreign service. They were not in the security services. They were not in the industrial defense sector. They were extremely un un underrepresented in the state, in government, in the state bureaucracy, in the Communist Party. And even in those sectors of the economy where Jews were prominent, like medicine, engineering, academia, they could not move up to the upper echelons of those fields. A Jew could be a physician, but he couldn't head a hospital department. A Jew could be a professor, but he could never be a dean. And since ethnicity was indicated on every Soviet citizen's internal passport, and Jews were considered an ethnicity, 
it was easy for institution to discriminate against Jews. You get the ID card, you see Jew, and you uh, act accordingly. The second field of state anti-Semitism, culture. There was a limited revival of Yiddish culture in this period. Again, I'm talking 53 to 80. A Yiddish literary magazine, Yiddish theater and concerts, but there was a total ban on Jewish education, whether it was for children or for adults, whether it was teaching Hebrew or teaching Yiddish. There were no Jewish organizations, no clubs or cultural centers. Commemoration of the Holocaust was discouraged and severely limited. Literature on Jewish subjects in Russian consisted mainly of anti-religious and anti-Zionist books. The third sphere of state anti-Semitism, religion. First of all, it should be explained, synagogues only engaged in prayer services. There were no meals, no celebrations, no classes, no libraries in synagogues. The number of synagogues dropped dramatically. Between 1959 and 1964, one third of all synagogues were closed down in the Soviet Union, and that is a higher percentage than Orthodox churches or Catholic churches that were closed down. The average circulation of books against Judaism was twice as large as the average circulation of books against Christianity. And many of these books portray Judaism, uh, portraying Judaism perpetuated anti-Semitic images of Jews. The fourth field, of course, best known, vilification of Israel and Zionism. Here, what I want to stress is Jews were the only ethnic group in the Soviet Union whose state was in the enemy camp, in the capitalist Western camp. Now, it's true, there was an ethnic German minority in the Soviet Union, but there were two German states, one in the Western enemy camp and one in the Eastern uh, socialist and friendly camp. So books named Fascism Under the Blue Star, 1971, equated Zionism with Nazism. And this preoccupation with Zionism meant that the Soviet press only offered negative images of Jews. There were no positive portrayals of Jews. Fifth and last, though it will become important, Soviet law, the ban on emigration. Soviet law permitted citizens to emigrate for the sake of family uni reunification, reunifying with relatives. And because of the Jewish historical experience, mass migration, the Holocaust, flight, most Soviet Jews actually had relatives abroad. But the number of Jews who were allowed to leave the country between 1953 and 1971 was negligible, less than 2,000 per year. Only in 1971, up till 1980, did this policy change. <clears throat> now, the Soviet authorities never openly embraced anti-Semitism. The term anti-Semitism was compromised in their eyes, as it was basically everywhere after World War II. They claimed that their policy was merely one of state atheism and anti-Zionism. Now, how did Jews deal with this? What allies did they find? Uh, <clears throat> In the 1950s and 60s, the strategies were of amelioration, and in the 1970s, it was strategies of confrontation. In the 50s and 60s, Soviet Jews appealed to the authorities to satisfy their social and cultural needs and invoked the Leninist principle of the brotherhood of Soviet peoples. They recalled Lenin's condemnation of anti-Semitism and, in fact, his criminalization of anti-Semitism. Jews hoped they would encounter in the state bureaucracy honest communists, Russians and Ukrainians in the state apparatus who truly believed in socialist principles such as the brotherhood of all Soviet peoples. And sometimes they did. Some colleges and institutes accepted Jews, but most rejected Jewish applicants. Jews quickly found out which colleges would admit, Jews, uh, would admit them. Some cities and towns prevented the construction of a Holocaust monument. Others allowed it, right? And those who did allow it would invoke the Leninist principle of the Brotherhood of Soviet Peoples. So to sum up this issue, the Soviet Union after Stalin was at its root a hypocritical country. 
It proclaimed the best principles of socialism and then went ahead and violated them most of the time. But the mere fact that they proclaimed these socialist principles, such as the Brothers of the Peoples, meant that some people could actually act on them when it came to the Jews, at least under certain circumstances. But overall, Jews had few allies in the state apparatus. Most officials were either afraid to intervene on behalf of Jews, or were just conformists following the established unwritten policy. And of course, many of them were hostile towards Jews. The friends Jews had inside the Soviet Union were mainly the liberal intelligentsia, people like the poet Yevgeny Evtoshenko, the author of the landmark poem Babiyar, or the Soviet composer Dmitry Shostakovich, who performed a series of musical uh, works from Jewish folk poetry. But the influence of the intelligentsia on the authorities was uncertain, certainly it was limited. So in the 50s and 60s, uh, the Soviets, <coughs> Jews had allies abroad. Uh, in those days, the 50s and 60s, the Soviets still cared about their image in Europe and they wanted to have foreign friends. And that is how the French and Italian communist parties and in the 50s and 60s, the French and Italian communist parties were real forces in their country's politics. Those parties could influence the Soviets on Jewish affairs. They brought to the authorities' attention that the total absence of Yiddish culture in the Soviet Union was unconscionable and harmful to the image of the country. So it's the French and Italian communists who get much of the credit for the token revival of Yiddish culture in the 1950s. Similarly, in 1956, you had delegations of American rabbis, Orthodox rabbis, who visited the Soviet Union. These were apolitical, meticulously apolitical rabbis who did not engage in Cold War rhetoric during or after their visits. Some of them were avowed political quietists with a don't provoke the Russian bear mentality. But these rabbis could have an effect. Shortly after their visits, the first legal rabbinical seminary in the Soviet Union, the Moscow Yeshiva, Kol Yaakov, was opened in 1957. Matzah became more readily available in the next few years after their visits. In short, foreign groups were influential in relaxing Soviet discriminatory policies. But these relaxations were too little, too late, too short. By the 1960s, the majority of Soviet Jews were not Yiddish speakers. <clears throat> they wanted Jewish literature in Russian. The Moscow Yeshiva and the distribution of matzah ran into headwinds of a fierce anti-religious campaign in 1959. The problems of discrimination in employment, higher education, the public vilification of Jews in the press, these questions were never addressed. They <clears throat> were either justified, those problems, or denied away. Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev said openly that the Soviets needed Jews in government positions in the early decades after the 1917 Bolshevik Revolution, but now the Russians and Ukrainians had their own cadres. It would be inappropriate to appoint Jews to high-ranking positions in Soviet Russia, Ukraine, or Lithuania, he said. And Khrushchev advanced his own anti-Jewish image in public statements, referred to Jews as refusing to engage in physical labor, telling stories about Jewish collaborators and the Nazis. So after the Six Day War, and this is of course known to many, um, what you get is a sharp break in Soviet Jewish um, attitudes to um, how to deal with um, anti-Semitism. Uh, they give up on the attainability of addressing discrimination, vilification, forced assimilation. And the only attainable goal that they see is the right to emigrate, to leave the Soviet Union. Uh, in the late 60s and early 70s, these people claim the system cannot be changed. The only thing that could be influenced was a decision to let Jews out 
in large numbers. A profoundly pessimistic approach, but it required having different allies. The allies that this new approach from 1970 on have is American, the American Jewish community, and the American US Congress. And the approach of the 70s is Soviet Jews protest, get arrested, um, risk their lives. American Jews support them. And American Jews press with the US Congress <clears throat> to make arms deals and trade deals contingent on Jewish emigration. So that's a strategy of foreign allies in confrontation uh, with the Soviet Union. Not amelioration, not uh, palliatives, but confrontation. I have two last comments. Um, now, of course, that what this movement achieved remarkable things. 250,000 Jews left the Soviet Union in the 1970s. It's the first break in the Iron Curtain. But of course, that approach, confrontation, also exacerbated Soviet anti-Semitism. Because with Jews leaving the country, it was even easier to portray them as traitors, as Zionists. Um, discrimination in employment in the 1970s grew. Admissions to higher education nosedived. This was the price that was paid for making an alliance with the West with open opponents of the Soviet Union. But this had a cyclical effect. The rise in anti-Semitism in the 1970s only led to a rise in desire of Jews to leave. Jews who had no interest in emigrating in 1971 wanted out by 1977. To conclude, the moral of this story, in my view, is that Jews have, can have very few influential allies in an authoritarian state that chooses anti-Semitism as its policy. Under certain circumstances, foreign pressure can make a difference if the Jewish issue becomes part of a quid pro quo. But the most effective strategy for Jews who are faced with an implacable state anti-Semitism is indeed the strategy of the 1970s, and that is to leave. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, everybody, for a wonderful panel. And I think right now uh, what I'd like to do is just Uh, I think there'll be two mics uh, circulating, and we'll take quest direct questions from the audience um, uh, to anybody. So does anybody, do we have the mics out there? Oh, okay. Does anybody have a, a question that they'd like to ask? Just raise your hand. Uh, I want to ask the... Uh, Could you stand up and yeah, identify I just, yourself? I <laughs> just want to ask the uh, professor who just gave the uh, uh, talk about Russia. Um, I learned fairly recently that uh, in the October revolution, communist revolution, that uh, one of the uh, benefits uh, for Jews was that uh, they were given citizenship uh, because the czar was gone, the nobility was gone, and everybody was considered a citizen, including the Jews. And they were treated fairly equally, access to schools and uh, government uh, funds, uh, and even uh, some art scholarships, uh, which I learned at the Jewish Museum uh, that uh, I went to. Uh, so what changed uh, over the years from this kind of benefit, uh, this new you know, life as 
an equal citizen to being marginalized you know, with anti-Semitism. That's a big question. That's a great question. Uh, I will only give... I want to be brief and fair, but I will only give two reactions what changed. Yes, it changed. I think state anti-Semitism in the Soviet Union really starts in 1948. Two things changed. One is there were less, Jew less and less Jews in the Soviet leadership. In the early Soviet leadership, there were a lot of Jews. By the 1940s, there were almost no Jews in the Soviet leadership. And if you want, this answer would say the repressed popular anti-Semitism resurfaces. Let me just say that. It had been repressed or banned for a generation, but then it resurfaces. The second answer is the other, the other thing that changed is called the Cold War. That is, um, Israel is seen almost very quickly as part of the enemy camp, as part of the Western camp. And that means that Jews are seen as an internal enemy in the Soviet Union. I have a you identify yourself, your name. I'm Laura Zell from Minnesota from the JCRC with my colleague Sammy. Um, I, have a, I have a question for Dr. Pat. Um, we're leading a trip this summer to Warsaw, educators from five different states. Is there, are there local, is there a local organization that we can learn this history from in Warsaw? What you just did, besides recommending your book, <laughs> thank you, but um, anything come to mind? Sure. Um, so um, I'm happy to provide suggestions, and Professor Fishman might also have ideas of, uh, yeah, so the Taube, uh, that's T-A-U-B-E, and Rebecca also suggested. I think that would be the first place that I would uh, turn to in terms of walking tours, connections in Warsaw, um, ways to sort of integrate this. Uh, and then obviously you can work through the Jewish Historical Institute as well. Um, uh, yeah. Hi, my name's Len Wasserman. I have a quick question for Professor Cobrin based on my personal experience. You talked about the students, the student strikes, the students, uh, protests at Columbia in 1917, and then what we're experiencing today. And I was curious, uh, again, based on my personal experience, uh, why you left out, didn't mention, you didn't mention the protests in 1968 against the Vietnam War. Uh, here, at, here at the, I graduated the joint program in 68. There was no graduation ceremony at Columbia because the Columbia campus was closed for three months because of the protests against the Vietnam War. And very similar, I mean, it's a direct parallel to 1917. And I was wondering whether you might have any thoughts about the, uh, the residences of that, ex historic residences of that experience, particularly since they were much more recent than 1917. Thank you for your question. So it's part, <laughs> no, it's part of a much longer, I have a whole, it's a, uh, I'm working on a book about Columbia and Jews across the 20th century. So I've actually, you know, there's a whole archive of the 68. We teach a class in the history department about the history of 68. Uh, and I have a whole chapter on it, but I want to put it in a larger framework. That's what we're doing here. Jews and their political, distinctive political beliefs have always interacted on Columbia's campus at different moments and different times. And we are seeing, I, I really actually didn't feel I talked about today, so about the present moment, but that's what I think I want the larger rubric for us to think about. In 1917, Jews were seen as socialists on campus. And after that, the Columbia trustees revamped 
admittance, you know, the whole notion that you want people from different regions in college admittance is born in this moment, right? It used to be Harvard drew from the Boston area. It, the, the universities drew from their areas, right? And people commuted. And it's a totally new framework. So I talk about it across. So today was only about 1917. I have a whole chapter. I've interviewed 20 people about 1968 and the Jewishness of 1968, okay, which is actually really interesting and how it interwoven politically. Um, 1968 has totally formed Colombia. It never wants it to happen again. And I, right? That is a, a bad mark on Colombia that they called the police in, right? Um, and I think the whole point of this panel is to think about how the history informs the present, right? And that, that I think is the most important thing to be thinking about, um, uh, how the past informs the present. We'll leave it at that. Hi, I'm Harriet Jackson, and I have a question for Professor Pat. I loved your presentation about the stateless Jews and giving them agency and looking at the nexus between the stateless Jews and the chaplains and AJC and other kinds of officials like from the U.S. government. So there was a precedent that started with this. There was this nexus already in operation, but um, to a very, very, very small extent in North Africa after the Allies liberated some of the Vichy labor camps. So does that precedent play into the kinds of um, solutions for statelessness that, um, that, you're, that, that you're uncovering and writing about? Thank you. Thank you for your question. That's a really, really interesting sort of broader framework for us to consider. So I'll just answer in, in brief um, about sort of the Allies' policy uh, towards Zionism specifically, because I think it is interesting for us to consider this, this context about sort of the, and to answer your question specifically about sort of North Africa and the European theater, it doesn't seem like there's a, a lot sort of we can see sort of this policy uh, being developed in 43 and 44 a realization that there will be people who were displaced by the war um, but uh, it doesn't seem that there's much preparation for the idea that there will be a sizable population displaced by the war who will not have homes to return to um, and so this is this is one of the key challenges posed by the Jewish population, because the assumption is that yes, there will be people who would be displaced, but if you categorize people according to national citizenship, then presumably in the aftermath of the war, there can be a process to repatriate them. Um, and so uh, it takes time for the allies, and here you know, there's different policy for the Americans and the British, um, and for the British, it very much is bound up with their Palestine policy and not sort of wanting to give a recognition of Jewish national aspirations that will conflict with their Palestine policy. Um, there, but the, the broader context is that for the Americans, it becomes clear that the American zone of occupation for the surviving Jewish population will be a place where Jews from all over Europe can um, congregate and that American policy is favorable to improving conditions for the Jewish population and is also favorable to the Zionist politics of the post-war population. And so you see, and there's a whole complex net nexus of factors, you see this uh, migration over the post-war period of a large population of Jewish survivors from Eastern Europe into the American zone of occupation, which then increases the pressure uh, to resolve the stateless condition of the surviving population. So. Um, hopefully that sort of addresses it, but I don't think there's much in terms of sort of the North African example that they then apply. It evolves from 1945 to 47 in the European theater. Hi, my name is Ben Goldberg. Um, Professor Coben, you used the term Stadlanut to describe Jacob Schiff's activism. Um, and I'm curious if you and or anyone else in the panel want to comment on that as like an explanatory framework sort of in all these different contexts that you were each talking about for Jewish activism and seeking of allies. 
Um, like, because I think none of the other three of you use that term, but it, I think it came up when talking about Hostilicrescus and various others that were mentioned. So, is that like an is that an explanatory framework in all these different contexts for Jewish, like what it, for Jewish sort of activism behavior? What does it gain? What do we lose by thinking about all these by Jews in all these very different contexts acting in this way? I. I want to have Professor Gampel answer also, because he has not had. But I would just say I used, I deployed Stadlanut, the notion that you use your wealth, both your status as a wealthy member of the community and actually giving away philanthropy. That is something I think is a little new, the way Shift does it. We haven't talked, Shift gave to many, many non-Jewish organizations as part of his program for Jewish integration. So I would like to say that Stadlanut is a little different in the United States, but what I was trying to do in the talk is talk about how a person like Morris Hilquit, who had no wealth, uses his activism and defends people in court. Um, I would actually argue, but I haven't found it yet, that he doesn't defend Leon Sampson because he's busy doing defending other non-Jews because the, the alliance is more important to him than just defending. But I, have to, I don't have a source for that yet. But I think this is an important framework to understand how Jews have done alliances and the importance of wealth and status in the past and in the present and how it's transformed when they come to America. But now we can go back five, cent <laughs> six centuries. Um, I wouldn't use the term Stadtlatnut, which is a term that we often use and employ when we speak about uh, modern Jewish history that it's not simply Jews who have wealth influencing the government, but it rather is a two-way street. The government is interested in bringing Jews and appointing them to high positions because the Jews, at least from the perspective of the Middle Ages, are perceived as not having pretensions to ultimate political power. So Jews can provide advice, Jews can provide linkages, yes, to wealthy Jews, but Jews are not the enemy. They're not the enemy domestically or in a foreign policy way. So Crescus is welcomed at court. I wouldn't see it as allies, but maybe in Barone's term, alliances of self-interest. Jews are only happy to take up that invitation. And what I was focusing on was, what are the limits? of Jews being at court. And it's truly not only in the Christian Middle Ages, it's true in the Muslim uh, period as well. Jews rise to high positions, but there are at moments when no longer those connections really are benefit the governments at large, and therefore the Jews are without protectors. Hi. So my name is Daniel Beller. Um, first of all, I want to thank the four of you and all of the organizers for the presentations that you made. But I'm very disappointed that we don't have two hours with each of you <laughs> because <laughs> you've just touched the surface and made us all want to know more, which of course is a hallmark of a good presentation. Uh, so I've been thinking of this subject matter and the title and trying to bring your talk, for the four of you, to a point of, so what's the conclusion? And in particularly in light of, in today's world of advocacy for human rights and so on, all of the organizations, the mantra is intersectionality. So is intersectionality and allyship meant to be the same thing in your minds or something different? But in particular, I think everything we've heard is these ally alliances end up kaput, basically. They, they, they run out of steam, they don't work. Um, is it nevertheless a good idea to seek alliances even though we know that at the end of the day they're, gonna, they're doomed? Do we, do we make a mistake by entering into alliances instead of totally focusing on what we can do for ourselves in what way? Or is it, as you say, Professor Gampel, they're great while they work, but they don't always work. So maybe you could address those issues. 
Uh, thank you, Dan. I appreciate your comment and your reflection. Yes, if Jews always need to seek alliances. We always need friends, and we keep our eyes opened. Because there are moments when self-interests are going to overlap, and we want to be in a position to take advantage of them. Hi, I'm Troy Zukowski from Michigan. I actually just had an opportunity to take a context course at JTS, and Professor Gampel was a medieval Judaism instructor. And one of the first things I learned was Jews were often intermediaries between the Islamic and the Christian world. That's very fascinating. I never really thought of that before. My question is more recent. President uh, Eisenhower, of course, was the president of Colombia in the aftermath of World War II. How did things change for Jews during that period from 48 or 47 to uh, 53? So this is what happens when you go in the archives. There's actually a lawsuit brought in 1943 that tries, that sues Columbia for its tax, it actually is suing the tax, New York State Tax Authority, that Columbia should use it, lose its tax exemption because of its treatments of African American and Jews, all right? Um, I think this is part of, a, as I said, this is part of a larger uh, manuscript in which thinking through how different groups discuss and deal with discrimination at Columbia um, across the 20th century. So, you know, it, there goes in waves. So there, there are more Jewish students. After 68, um, there's a thing called Dudley's Follies. It's 1961 in which the admissions, uh, head of admissions uses only test scores and the, the class is 60% Jewish and he's fired the next year, okay? <laughs> but I, we laugh because we've now accepted that that's unacceptable, right? No, could, imagine any university saying now, I'm only using test scores, and the top 3% is who's getting in. That would never happen. And I just want us to think, this framework for thinking about college is born in a certain historical moment. And we have to think about what happened in that historical moment and why these concepts are then developed, and we take them as given, but they're not given. And that, that's, that's what I was trying to do with that moment. So there is a pendulum of, of how many students that it varies across the 20th century. Fantastic. And one last question. Uh, Jonathan Gelman. Okay. Yeah. Jonathan Gelman. I'm curious about the cross currents, uh, like in the turn of the 20th century, uh, between, on the one hand, uh, American leaders being very concerned about pogroms in Russia and trying to press, put pressure on Russia, and yet at the same time, as you've noted, that there was significant domestic anti-Semitism. And I wonder, it, it almost sounds a little bit like things that have happened in the last decade, this kind of cross-current. I'm not sure I understand the question. That, okay that anti-Semitism becomes a target of attack here when it's abroad, but when there's concern about the, the role of, of Jews in America, at roughly the same time, there's a discrimination. Yes. Yeah. Do you want to leave? Yeah. I have something to say. Okay, I'll, I'll let um, Rebecca sort of, as an expert on American Jewish history, uh, reflect on it, but I just, I want to, I think what you're getting at just as a point that's important for us to bear in mind as we think about the history of anti-Semitism is that we have to be very specific, right? That, um, you know, the, the reasons and the manifestations for Jewish hate uh, function differently in different contexts, right? So, um, you know, the anti-Jewish violence that we see across history, right? It's not the same specific causes, it functions differently. So in you know, uh, late 19th century Russia, there are specific factors that, that lead to outbursts of anti-Jewish violence that are actually quite different historically than what we might see as anti-immigrant sentiment in America in the late 19th and early 20th century that then leads to very restrictive immigration policies. So I think one of the things that we have to do is uh, you know, we, I know we use this term anti-Semitism, but we probably actually need to be much more specific about what we're talking about and what the factors are and what, what leads to it. And 
Um, Rebecca, you might want to say something about the cross currents. Yes. Yeah, so I, I think what you're you're asking is um, American leaders speaking out against the pogroms, right? So Jacob Schiff, as we know, used right trading with Japan to help defeat Russia. But Jacob Schiff is not against the Jews of Eastern Europe. He is not the one calling out the socialism. That is among the board of trustees. So I have to just, there are many different groups, and I'm sorry, because in 20 minutes. So I would say that Jacob Schiff is among the group of, uh, um, they're called, Ger he is German Jewish, but of elite established New Yorkers who are concerned with the politics that Jews from Eastern Europe bring to the United States. But I would never call that, then I think this gets, I would never call him anti-Semitic. Right, right, so I'm trying to say, I think it's, it's clear to, under, you know, to understand different groups are interacting in New York continually throughout history, right? And in, indeed, the New York Jewish community, as I said, is the largest in the world, is extremely diverse. And understanding how different groups interact with each other he is extremely concerned, and that letter shows. He wants a trustee, but he also wants that 25% of the class of Columbia is Jewish and that they shouldn't be limited. So I think in, in many ways he is supportive. He uh, cr critiques what is taking place in Tsarist Russia and tries to be supportive in New York, but is cognizant. And I, you know, I didn't get into it. New York City is petrified of Helquit. He almost won the mayor election. And he was anti-war. So that would be the biggest city in the United States, elects a mayor who is openly anti-war in 1917 after the United States declared war. That is enormous, and they are petrified of that. So you have to just put that in this larger mix of understanding the different groups in New York City. Great, and I think we're going to have to cut it off here. Um, so we're going to, after all this, you know, fantastic, uh, these fantastic presentations. We're going to break a little bit for lunch in the private dining room. Uh, they can be eaten in the cafe and courtyard. And then the post-lunch session on library materials will be back in the auditorium. Thanks so much for your attention.